John Huffman, an innocent chemistry teacher, became infamous overnight for his part in creating synthetic marijuana, a drug 10 times more potent than normal weed. His creation of a single chemical compound led to a worldwide health epidemic where thousands of teens and adults alike experienced seizures, bleeding from their eyes, psychotic episodes, and many, many more horrible symptoms from smoking it. But his responsibility in creating all of that madness isn't what you think it is. From being fascinated with chemistry as a kid to thousands of families blaming him for their kids' deaths, the story of John and synthetic marijuana is a shocking tale of ambition, chaos, and tragedy. But how did a man with such an innocent job find himself in such a horrible situation? To answer that, we need to travel back to the 1930s, when John was just an innocent kid who loved doing one thing more than anything else. Long before his name was tied to a potent drug that started an epidemic, John Huffman was just a normal kid growing up in Evanston, Illinois. Evanston was a quiet academic town shaped by the presence of one of the most prominent colleges in the US, Northwestern University. It's the kind of place where most residents were scholars and generally smart people, and John was right on track to become one of them thanks to his love of chemistry. While most kids his age were into football or chasing tail, John was reading textbooks and absorbing as much info as he could about atoms, molecules, and all of the other shit I forgot from high school. He put his knowledge to use too. At just 15 years old, he and a few friends accidentally started a fire in the street while mixing chemicals from a chemistry set. While no one got hurt, John ended up at the police station for how wild this play day was, an early sign of just how dangerous his passion could become. Years later, when it was time to choose a college major, his father nudged him toward medicine because, well, he was a doctor. But John wasn't interested in dealing with patients. He was more drawn to cooking up chemicals in a lab. So he enrolled at Northwestern to study chemistry and later earned his PhD in it from Harvard in 1957. So clearly a guy that knows his shit. Not long after becoming a doctor, he joined the faculty at Clemson University to teach the youth about chemistry and also to be a lab rat. Not that he was forced to run in mazes looking for cheese, but he just loved to experiment. And more specifically, he loved to experiment with one niche category of chemicals, synthetic compounds that were designed to target the same receptors in the brain that THC latched onto. And yes, that is extremely niche. So why was he so honed in on that? I mean, this guy looks like the farthest you could be from being interested in anything to do with weed. So what gives? Well, up until the 1980s, the way THC worked in the brain was a mystery. It was obvious that consuming it gave the user some psychological effects, but scientists were stumped on how the chemistry evolved that worked in the brain. But that all changed in 1988, when researchers Alan Howlett and William Devon discovered the CB1 and CB2 receptors in the brain. Now, I know that sounds like gibberish to you, but this revelation was huge because they found out that these receptors were responsible for getting you stoned. It turned out THC THC wasn't just drifting aimlessly in the brain when you lit up. It was locking onto these receptors, and further experiments found that these receptors were involved in controlling a wide range of physiological processes in the human body, from sleep to appetite, mood, pain, and more aka an amazing opportunity to experiment with. This discovery enabled chemists to create their own handcrafted synthetic cannabinoids that targeted the CB1 and CB2 receptors to see if they could develop new compounds for medicines, treatments, or anything to help people. And for John, this was a challenge he simply couldn't resist. With funding provided by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, he dove into this world headfirst during the 1990s and started building a library of synthetic cannabinoids. To tweaking molecular structures and running test after test on lab rats who also have those same CB1 and CB2 receptors to see what would happen to them. He would label each of his new compounds with his initials, JWH001, JWH002, and on and on. And by the end of his experimenting, he had created over 400 of these compounds, each one catalog, documented, and later uploaded online with full details for other chemists to look into and build off his research for the greater good of people. But not everyone had the same goal in mind. In 2008, John received an unexpected message from a blogger based in Germany. Attached to this message was a magazine article about a young man who had been badly hospitalized after smoking something called Spice. This newfound drug was taken to a lab by forensic scientists and tested, and what the results showed was a familiar chemical compound found within, JWH-018. 
eight. This was a shock to John. How did one of his compounds he synthesized in a lab thousands of miles away make it into a kid's lungs in the streets of Germany? And why did it end up almost killing him? Well, it turns out, it wasn't just a German thing. While the exact names of the people who brought it overseas are unknown, JWH-018 was first noted to be used by a South Korean company who were selling the compound as a plant growth enhancer. Very weird, but from there, it made its way to China, where things took a way darker turn. Shady chemists in the country discovered that JWH-018, when smoked, had similar effects on the brain as typical weed, but up to 10 times as strong. After this discovery, these guys sprayed the compound onto dry herbs, like tea leaves, sealed it up in flashy foil packets, slapped a not for human consumption label on them, and gave it a catchy name, Spice. They then marketed it as an herbal incense and sold it at large, proving that China's marijuana laws are a complete joke and also that people were very interested in getting high legally. But these highs didn't come without consequences. Panic attacks, hallucinations, seizures, and in some cases, full-blown psychotic episodes were just a few of the hundreds of symptoms discovered when you smoke something that wasn't meant to be smoked in the first place. Shocker. Within months, a spice made its way and spread rapidly across Europe. Black market labs copied the formula and rebranded it under names like K2, Potpourri, and others, and John became infamous. Because the compound could be traced back to his original research and started receiving lots of emails, some from amateur chemists looking for tips, but the majority from devastated parents blaming him for ruining their kids' lives. I thought it was sort of hilarious at the time. I started hearing about some of the bad results and I thought, hmm, I guess someone opened Pandora's box. And they sure as hell did. But John always made his stance clear, telling anyone who would listen that these compounds were never meant for humans. And that was true. Every compound he made had only been tested on lab rats and were definitely not tested for human consumption. I think this was something that was more or less inevitable. It bothers me though that people are so stupid as to use this stuff. But clearly, no one was interested in his professional take. Not the consumers, and definitely not the chemists making it. They were rolling in bread selling this garbage, mainly because recreating the compound was super easy. It only took three starting materials and two steps, and the profit margins on it were at levels Mark Cuban would invest in. And so, the rise of Spice was running full steam ahead and it was inevitable that the Spice train would eventually make its way to its biggest market yet. On a cold day in December 2008, the US Customs and Border Protection in Dayton, Ohio seized a suspicious looking package. What they found in it were tons of shiny, Ziploc looking packages labeled as herbal incense. It had finally happened. Spice had arrived in the US, showing up in ports across the country in neat packaging with bright branding and admittedly fun names like Mr. Happy, Scooby Snacks, and Phantom Wicked Dreams. Now, you'd think the seizure of Spice in 08 would set off alarm bells somewhere to someone important enough to put an end to it but that didn't happen. Instead, Spice was sitting on shelves at gas stations, smoke shops, and websites across the country for as low as five bucks a pack, and it was technically legal to do so. You see, recreational weed was still largely banned in the US at the time, but this stuff, like many other suspect products, was still able to be sold through a loophole. Because 018 wasn't recognized as a controlled substance, it was legal to sell and possess by default. Plus, with the addition of the totally useful, not for human consumption label, and the deceptive marketing that claimed Spice was an herbal incense, the US government let it slot. And people were having a blast with it. Thousands of people, ranging from teens to anyone who needed to pass a drug test, were all for smoking Spice, mainly because it was a legal high they could get for cheap. On paper, it seemed like the greatest move of all time. But then, poison control centers started receiving calls. A lot of calls. In 2009, poison control centers got just 112 calls related to synthetic marijuana. Two years later, it exploded to over 6,500. Patients were reported to have hallucinations, seizures, psychotic episodes, extremely rapid heart rates, and many, many more symptoms. The horror stories from using Spice were even worse. One man threw his girlfriend off an 11 floor balcony after smoking a batch. A 16 year old girl named Emily Bauer suffered a series of strokes, leading to permanent blindness, partial paralysis, and severe cognitive impairment. An Iowa teenager named David Rosga died by suicide shortly after smoking it. And these were just three of the many horrific cases reported of people enduring psychotic episodes, having brain bleeding, being in comas, and 
and ending up dead. So what was John thinking when he heard about all of these cases? Well, he didn't have much remorse for them. He said these people were idiots for getting into something never tested on humans, and described anyone who used Spice as a potential Darwin Award winner. Which, I mean, is pretty fair to say, but these tragedies didn't stop the US government from getting involved once and for all. After a few years of testing various batches of Spice, the DEA found that multiple of John's synthetic compounds, such as the classic 018, 073, and 200 were showing up, as well as other derivative compounds not made by John. Because of this, they issued a temporary emergency ban on five of the most common compounds found three of which had been created by John. And later in 2012, Congress stepped in and passed the Synthetic Drug Abuse Prevention Act, banning 15 synthetic compounds by labeling them as a Schedule 1 drug. And for a second, it felt like everyone could take a deep breath because the nightmare was over. But no. Because here's the thing, banning those chemicals didn't stop the underground chemists who were making them it inspired them. Even if the government outlawed a compound, rogue labs just tweaked their compounds slightly, created new ones, and were still able to sell them everywhere. The legal situation had turned into a game of whack-a-mole and the government simply couldn't keep up. Meanwhile, things got even worse. Hospitals across the country began documenting a dramatic increase in synthetic cannabinoid-related incidents. Emergency room visits related to Spice were around 11,000 in 2010, and a year later, over 28,500, with 55% of them coming from people 20 years old or younger. At this point, Spice wasn't just a public health concern anymore. It was a full-blown drug epidemic and a multi-billion dollar industry. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that. It was estimated that the synthetic marijuana industry at its peak was literally an international multi-billion dollar juggernaut, generating hundreds of millions of dollars annually worldwide between the chemists making it to the people selling it. It was an unstoppable force. By 2015, law enforcement had identified more than 500 total synthetic drug compounds, each one more more potent and profitable than the last. Take the compound AMBFUBINACA for example, one that could be purchased for around 3500 per kilogram and sold for more than $500,000 after creating and selling the spice from it. There was just too much money to be made and it was too easy to bypass any sort of law put in place because making a new compound was so simple. The hospital cases for these new compounds got even worse too. In May 2014, 50 overdose cases were linked to synthetic marijuana, but just a month later, that number exploded to 439. The symptoms were even crazier. People were bleeding from their eyes, their gums, and even internally. Some turned into zombies, others had superhuman strength, and a few were trying to remove their own eyeballs. It's insane to think about how one guy just doing his job and trying to improve medicine ended up sparking one of the craziest outbursts of a drug in human history. And speaking of John, people were pissed at him. John's inbox was continuing to blow up with messages from grieving parents, panicked friends, and devastated families, all essentially asking the same thing. Why did you create this? Even though this horrible situation wasn't John's fault, it became too much for him. He stopped responding to interview requests and emails and made himself impossible to reach. He retired from Clemson University and moved to a reclusive life in the Smoky Mountains of North Carolina with his wife and children. He closed down his lab and let his grant expire, concluding his line of research in synthetic cannabinoids. However, that didn't mean he was fully done working with them. After retiring from being a professor, John spent most of his time being an advocate and preventing people from using Spice. He worked with law enforcement agencies, military officials, and the DEA by giving his professional advice on the compounds they would find in the streets to aid in prevention. What's even cooler is Canada asked him to serve as a consultant and expert witness to help dilute the use of Spice in Canada. Hell, he even worked with Germany by sending mass spectrometer data to help them identify the active ingredients in C spice products. He was doing everything he could to stop people from smoking these nasty ass chemicals, and his efforts seemed to pan out well. Today, spice generally isn't showing up in gas stations or public places anymore but of course, they haven't totally disappeared. They're mostly hidden now, sold through shady websites and through dealers who move them quietly away from public view. It's not perfect, but it's way better than what it was before. As for John, he spent his final years in quiet isolation, tucked away in his mountain home with his family, and passed away on May 14th, 2022.